Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Brown, work for the National Trust. Um, also sit on the Special Interest Group Committee. Um, appreciate it's been a bit of a, a long day, um, probably quite warm and stuffy in Mars. Um, not going to talk for too long, but while I do have you uh, trapped here as an audience, I did want to take the opportunity to kind of highlight um, and flag the, the volunteer and community archaeology special interest group has created a competence matrix. Uh, this was kind of pretty much launched in 2020 uh, after a bit of development work. So with all the conversations that have been going on today about public benefits, that kind of engagement, some of the challenges over the last couple of years, um, it seems like a very good time to take this opportunity to kind of re-highlight it, re-flag the, that this is out there, um, and also use a bit of a, a potential of a little discussion platform to, to see actually is it kind of still fit for purpose, what changes do we, you know, should we be making, but also just to kind of, I think, pick up on a lot of the conversation today is to kind of really flag the, the kind of diversity and some of the wide challenges of a, a role um, kind of, well, what we kind of branch under community archaeology. So, as possibly most of you are aware, the, the specialist matrix, matrix, the, um, the specialist matrixes um, are advisory documents to support the, the main competence matrix um, and is, is there to assist applicants in understanding how their work fits into that kind of main, that main matrix and identifying information that kind of applicants should be giving to support their their kind of application or their um, upgrade to the different levels. The, as I said, it was kind of produced in 2020. Um, I think I've said that bit already. Yeah, we're kind of there. So I'm not going to not going to rehash the application process. Um, probably all of you here and sitting in the room have been through it at some point or done an upgrade. Um, but while majority of you are CFA members. There is also, it is always worth highlighting that there is the opportunity for members of the public to join the special interest groups, potentially not joining CIFA. So um, basically, it's that kind of idea that this could be these kind of competence matrices or the special interest groups potentially offer a different pathway for people to kind of join the, uh, the CIFA family. And as a result, that potentially provides the opportunity to widen the reach of CIFA beyond its traditional membership and through positive and constructive engagement with a wider volunteer and communities. So again, the kind of conversation we're having today is about potentially how we are looking at how we are doing community archaeology, uh, public benefit, but actually, as uh, Nina's mentioned, that's a two-way kind of uh, relationship. So actually, do we need to be looking at how we kind of, how we engage with those, those kind of communities and actually bring them into, into the CIFA as well. Um, the matrix is a, is a basic, it's pretty much a snapshot, um, a, an overview in a few columns. Uh, we're looking at the practitioner level here kind of thing. Um, but as I kind of made a reference to, it does really show a, a very diverse skill set. Um, I might try and move on to the next one. Um, you can see it just about fits on a screen uh, for the associate one there. Um, and Let's say this, the, the, the diverse skill set required, um, I think it's something that we really need to be flagging um, on a regular basis to um, employers as well. It's not just a case of parachuting um, someone in to do a bit of community archaeology. Um, so that kind of wider knowledge of the matrix and sharing that with employers or kind of partners, I think is very important. And yeah, a kind of a strong step um, or first step, sorry, in building wider awareness uh, for the challenges as well as the opportunities of kind of good community engagement. So um, I appreciate that's actually a really heavy text slide. I probably should have done something a bit more kind of fun and whizzy or you know, things, but again, probably in a PowerPoint, not lots of fading in of bullet points. I won't go through all of them now. What I did want to highlight was just the things in the associate um, level and then upwards was um, as well as potentially running, training, and activities on site. Um, there's been a few references, references to it today. The really important side of building in evaluation, um, because that's actually how we learn, how we can, again, have that two-way process. Um, the associate starts reference, the, it doesn't, it's not mentioned the practitioner level, but from the associate level upwards, there is actually a conversation about the reference of understanding public benefit and be able to talk with that with confidence. Um, and also from associate upwards, there's that idea of risk 
um, starting to understand the risk. And a big one as well is the finances. So if we start listing out just a few of these bullet points, again, really starts to emphasize that it's, there's a lot more going on. And I think there's been a few references to it today. It's about having some of the time. So actually setting aside the time to do this well um, is going to actually help us all in the long run. Um, as part of um, preparing for conference, um, we did actually circulate a, an ask for our newsletter, and I think across our social media, for some examples of how the, uh, the matrix has been used recently by people applying uh, for the various levels. So I'm going to invite Jessica to, to come up. Um, I realize I haven't actually gone on to the member, but again, you can find this all online. Um, so just to flag it, Jessica's going to talk through um, a couple of examples and feedbacks we got from people that have used this recently, and then we'll use that to kind of go on to discuss where we're going to go next with this. Hello again, everybody. Okay, so I'm sure you remember me from about 10 minutes ago. Um, but I'm Jessica Lowther, I'm a community archaeologist at Headland, and I also sit on the voluntary and community um, specialist group. So um, this is one of the quotes uh, that Gail Graham emailed us through uh, just on her experience of using the VSIC matrix. Um, and she says, I successfully upgraded my associate membership, which she'd held since 2002, at the end of last year to member level using the VSIG matrix. It was exactly what I needed to give me the confidence to know I was working at the appropriate competency level and apply. More importantly, perhaps, was that it demonstrated that the specific skill set needed in community archaeology were specialist and had also been acknowledged within CIFA. And I think that definitely touches on what you were saying in our, in our last session, David, is that there is a, a, you know, a specific skill set that people that work in community archaeology and engagement do have. Um, we also have a comment from one of our other members who's here with us today. So um, Clem, I might ask her to expand on this. Um, so if we could have our microphone handler. So at the moment, I've just um, been advertising internally for um, sort of trainee community archaeologists. And within my organisation, we have a series of sort of uh, training uh, matrices um, for various different specialisms um, internally, but not one for community archaeology. And so um, I want to use the CIFA matrix actually as the basis for the learning agreement with uh, my appointed trainees um, in the hope that actually it will encourage them to apply to CIFA and actually use that um, as a career progression as well as structuring um, for me an understanding of where their base level is and the areas that they uh, we, we can work on together so for me it was incredibly helpful to already have that work already done and I don't see any requirement for me to have to replicate that within my own organisation if that already exists with CIFA and, it's, and it kind of gives um, my staff um, an opportunity to, to be recognised by the profession. That's wonderful. So yeah definitely, um, so as well as um, asking people from the community to give us some experiences. Um, I am very new to the Voluntary and Community Committee. Um, I joined in January, I think it was. Um, and just as we were planning this conference and planning to go through the competency matrix and, and talking a little bit about, I wonder if people have used it, I wonder what it was like, you know, and I sort of just piped up in our like initial meeting and I said, well, I used it. <laughs> it was me, I used it. Um, so I became the community archaeologist for Headland Archaeology last year in June. Um, and I thought one of the good professional steps to take would to be to join CIFA um, as an AFA. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so when I was looking through um, the, the CIFA online documents and navigating the whole applying for CIFA role, I came across the, the, the VSIG matrix. Um, and just a little bit of background for me. So I come from a background of education. Um, that was my first degree. I'm a qualified primary school teacher. I didn't teach, but I did do a lot of 
um, before and after school care and vacation care where I grew up in, in South Australia. And they have their own curriculum for that. It's not just a care setting for them. There is a learning and play curriculum. Um, and I was responsible for planning learning activities and really engaging with kids and finding out what they wanted to learn and putting that into the, into the curriculum for them. So I got to do some really cool stuff because I really love archaeology and I did then even if I wasn't studying it. And there's not a lot of great space in the South Australian um, education curriculum for the Vikings, but there is if in a care setting. So if they wanted to learn about it, we did it. We transformed games halls into Viking longhouses and we did all sorts of cool and fun activities. So when I decided that um, I wanted to be an archaeologist for real, um, and I went back to university and studied archaeology, and I moved here and became a field archaeologist, I started doing, going out on community archaeology projects as well because um, that's where my skill set lie. I was quite happy with doing that and I wanted to do it. I was passionate about that. Kind of found that real little niche squad where I was like, yeah, I can do this actually. This is really fun and I really love this. So, um, however, I was, I was kind of, I was, I was told perhaps that if I followed community archaeology and I went and did a job in community archaeology, that I would be behind in my fieldwork career. I'd be behind in my archaeology career. I'd be behind my peers, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't progress as fast as everybody else. Um, I ignored that. Um, so I persevered anyway. I was like, that's OK. This is what I want to do. Um, so I did community archaeology, and I just, I just loved it. And I can tell you now that you know, I ran a, a community archaeology project on a, a scheduled monument. Um, would I have done that in fieldwork? Possibly not. Um, but I did run it. I learned managerial skills, communication skills, and research skills. I got to write, write about them, and I got to you know, do the archaeology as well. Um, and I'm most definitely not behind in my career, I don't think. Might be different, but I'm not behind. So when I found the matrix, I just, I just thought, yeah, actually, I can tick all these boxes. I, I can actually apply as a community archaeologist with all those specialist skills that I have from all those several different places that I've been in, in my career, in my life. And I have archaeology skills, but I do have a lot of engagement skills, communication skills, and managing like community projects as well, because they take a little bit of a special, a special touch to them. Um, so for me, the matrix really just gave me that confidence boost that I needed to recognize that this was, this was OK. I wasn't behind. I, I have a position. I have somewhere professionally that I am. And I'm not behind anybody else just because I do something different. I actually have a specialism which is pretty cool. So I don't know if anybody else wants to share anything about um, anything we've discussed today. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Just while you're um, all thinking about your questions on the content of uh, the uh, specialist matrix, there are a couple of um, online comments uh, that were added just, just right at the end of the last session, but um, I hope you don't mind me reading, reading that now. Um, Kat Hartford Lewis just notes that while we were talking about planning a lot before, um, uh, not and not all work takes within, not, not all work takes archaeological work takes place within that framework, and so some of the language is slightly different when you're talking about things that happen in you know, uh, natural environment settings and things like that. So it's just a, uh, an interesting point that you know the, the, the language has to be adaptable to those different situations where archaeology is being done. Um, and another point um, from Sarah Jane Farr who says, if I can scroll down to it, um, if local authorities have strategies for engagement in health, social education, and planning, for example, surely archaeology just becomes part of this norm. Doesn't matter how little it is, we just need to equip a curator for a start with confidence and skills to embed within their LPAs and show the outcomes. I think when we were planning this session, there was kind of ambitions to be 
more time wider and look at things like um, potentially the work we do in the National Trust or what goes on with Forestry England or the Ministry of Defence, where pretty much as standard we are kind of building that into any briefs that we're putting out for work to engage volunteers, members. So that is all going on. I think, yeah, this session was end up being more focused on the kind of planning process, but definitely points that we need to be taking on that there is a lot more wider activity, but also that kind of expertise that can be shared backwards and forwards kind of thing. So again, taking bits from, you know, sharing, supporting each other. Um, we're all in it for the same reasons. So uh, let's make the most of that. Um, aware of the, the time. So unless there really is any kind of pressing questions or statements that people want to about, say about using the, the matrix, um, I thought I might just kind of talk about what we're going to do, be doing as our next steps around the matrix. And um, Dan's already mentioned kind of the work around the guidance. Um, just kind of say some of the next steps and I'll probably bring it to a close. Um, I'm not sure there was an announcement or something to make about where everyone's going afterwards, but um, I'm not sure. I think there was a vote going on in Cadence, wasn't there, kind of thing. So I'm not sure the results are in or what was going on, but um, I'm sure we'll find somewhere to go afterwards in, in small groups that maybe sort of gather. Um, so I think, yeah, one of the things we did want to flag actually was um, we have got a competence matrix, but we haven't got the standards and guidance. So we actually need that to back up, but that's one we are addressing. Um, the other one that I wanted to highlight is that the, um, another of the special interest groups, the graphics group, have done a, quite a detailed breakdown on their website on actually talking people through how to use their specialist matrix to apply. So that's something we're going to be looking to replicate for the, um, the community archaeology group as well. Um, and I encourage you to go and find that, because that is quite a nice, clearly set out if you have got any of your colleagues kind of scratching their head or pulling their hair out about how to go through that kind of um, that process to the validation committee. There's some nice guidance on that. Um, another side linked into that validation um, kind of panel is making sure there is actually the expertise around community archaeology and understanding of that on the validation uh, panel. So make sure that's in place. Um, and I think there's it's about eight, valida uh, eight validation meetings a year, um, but also looking to gather evidence from those validation meetings about how many people might be using the matrix and kind of look at how we can kind of um uh well, was a point i was going to make about that but uh but yeah it was it's, it was really important but it's gone uh, <laughs> uh and then so it's linked to what nina has mentioned is about those kind of maybe it's not always the kind of thing on loads and loads of case studies but look at kind of little kind of bite-sized cpd training plans and case studies um of how people have used the matrix to apply for the different kind of upgrades and share those against the wider community as well. Um, and I think my final point was about ensuring there's um, expertise on the validation committee, which I would have said. So pretty much, I think, unless anyone has any um, pressing things they want to share um, to uh, celebrate the end of the day or not, I will draw it to close and say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, and yeah, obviously, uh, be, I think we've probably met most of the faces on the panel, um, on the um, committee group now, so do feel free to uh, come and bend our ear about any issues or challenges or opportunities you'd like to see us kind of helping you with. So, uh, but yeah, thank you very much for listening, and uh, see you all tomorrow, officially. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>